business is booming, baby. I mean, UFC 256 was amazing, right? Uh, we had that title fight with Moreno and Davison. Both of those fighters came off fights like not even, what, a couple weeks ago? And now here they are fighting each other, not even able to really specifically prepare for one another and they put on one of the best fights of the year uh i was just really impressed with how marino um was able to kind of match uh figure figueredo's strength you know like most guys you could tell this guy's way too big for 25 and he's way too strong for these other guys hits way too hard for these guys to deal with but with marino it was like okay early on you you saw good signs of this guy's going to stay in the fight. This guy's definitely going to put up a, a challenge, you know, and he's not, you know, he's able to take Davison down. He's able to out clinch him. He's able to kind of out muscle him on some of those takedowns. And I thought that was one of the biggest takeaways for me. And I knew right away, I was like, all right, this guy's in this fight. You know, he's not going to go away quick like, like some other guys. And, uh, you know, I don't think Davison's power is going to be, you know, a, a, uh, a fearful thing for Brandon Marino. A lot of those guys get hit by him and they're like, "What? what's going on? Like, this is different. Uh, but yeah, Marino actually showed good durability and, and, and good cardio as well. You know, I thought maybe, uh, I thought, I mean, uh, I thought Davis and Figueredo was going to fade if the later rounds came about four and five. You know, I, I, I leaned towards Marino to be able to take a decision then if it got that far. But it went five rounds and Davison looked good throughout the whole fight you know he didn't really fade too much and that guy throws big power he has it packs a lot of muscle at 125 and uh you know that was an amazing performance on both ends you know i wish there was two titles to give those guys but um that just catapults the flyweights they're they're really making uh flyweights look better and better every time they fight it's like you know, we keep reminding ourselves, like, why did we ever even have to talk about getting rid of th this division? I mean, these guys are some of the most exciting guys in the game. You know, they're fully skilled in all assets, speed, power, durability, technique. Like, everything's on point with these guys. So, it's amazing to see. Um, we got a Boomachino, too. Don't get it twisted. We ain't slipping over here. Got to take a sip every once in a while. Um, Tony Ferguson. Well, actually, you know, sticking to this fight still. Um, what's next for Davison? What's next for Moreno? Uh, you know, you got to do a rematch, in my opinion. I think the fight was too close. I mean, we had a majority draw. One judge gave it to Figueroa. The other two gave it a draw, majority draw. So... Fight was really close, really competitive, and to be one of the best fights of the year for a title fight, especially at flyweight, I think you definitely got to do the rematch. Um, maybe you do something like a, a, a Perez versus um, who did uh, maybe, maybe you do per, uh, Perez? Who's who's um, Benavidez fighting? Askar Askarov, right? Yeah, so you have that fight in the wings, and then you got Perez. And I forget who else, but maybe you match up Perez and that person, and you have the rematch, and you have uh, a little thing going on there at the top of the division. Um, but yeah, uh, Figueredo was transported to the hospital. Those guys both fought twice in like two weeks and a half, so you got to imagine they're going to take some time off and, and probably not be back until about March, I would say, which would make a lot of sense. So look out for that. But uh, Ferguson versus Oliveira, man, the uh, co-main event. A lot of the talk was like, how bad did, you know, that Gaethje loss affect Tony Ferguson? You know, were we going to see the same guy? You know, was he going to be re fully recovered and, and come back stronger from that? You know, at the age of 38, uh, Ferguson, you know, had different corners in this fight. There was a lot of speculation about that. No Eddie Bravo, uh, no boxing coach that he had as head coach. Um and, you know, that was uh, a little bit of a warning sign for a lot of people. But you never know. Sometimes guys make decisions based off of how they feel and what's best for them. And you can't really judge that. So I think a lot of people were just surprised. Like, no Eddie Bravo, you know, 10th Planet Black Belt. Like, where is he? You know, and, and where's Rashad Coulter, the, the boxing coach? Uh, we Everyone thought, you know, those were good coaches. But... Something something along the lines didn't work out with them. So Ferguson, you know, just didn't look great in this fight. I mean, you can't take away anything from Charles Oliveira with such a dominant performance. Jiu-Jitsu, takedowns, 
striking, everything. He was just on point, you know, to cut through Tony Ferguson like that. Like, we've never seen that. And I think, you know, that surprised a lot of people. But now we know what level, you know, Oliveira is at. You know, this guy is a terror. Like, that arm bar was insane. Um, you know, props to Tony for not tapping on that. That was crazy. But the transitions, the movement, the fluidity on the bottom, I mean, on on, on top, on the ground, and, and transitioning from submission to submission, that triangle choke he had was close. Like, he just outpositioned him in every way possible. He was throwing a lot of submission threats. He went for the finish. He looked crisp on the feet. You know, it wasn't like the whole fight took place there. But you, from what we saw, Oliveira looked amazing on the feet. And I think he had some tiger's eye with him. So let's not say that wasn't the complete reason why he won, of course. But, you know... Um, what do you do with Oliveira, man? Now you start to question, like, is this the best guy? You know what I mean? Like, what would happen if this guy and Khabib were on the ground? Like, would it be a mauling like everyone else? Or, like, or would this guy be able to potentially put Khabib at threat with submissions? Like, he's that good, you know? His, his, his jiu-jitsu is unmatched in that division. Now, can he deal with a smothering ground-and-pound grappler like Khabib? I don't know. Probably not, because nobody else could, but... Now, that just opens the floodgates. We want to see Oliveira fight everybody now, right? We want to see him fight Connor. We want to see him fight Poirier, Hooker, uh, Chandler, Gaethje, all these guys. You know, like, Oliveira is a problem. I think, I think stylistically, he's going to be a rough night out for everybody, especially with his wrestling looking sharp like that. Nobody's going to want to take this guy down, and his striking's ever improving, and he's a long, big, tall guy for the weight class, so just a a lot of a lot of problems for for uh, lightweights right now with this guy, um, and then we had Mackenzie Dern versus Vienna Genaroba. I was impressed with both of these ladies. I you know I I thought the main thing with Mackenzie Dern. It's huge that she's focusing on her boxing a lot with Jason Perillo. I think they're dynamic. Uh, their dynamics great. I think Perillo's cornering was just amazing in that fight. Just knowing his fighter, knowing how to keep you calm and focused on the task, even throughout you know a broken nose or whatever, a cut. You know that's kind of you got blood got, getting in your eyes. You're kind of starting to question things, and then there's Jason Perillo comes in and kind of calms it all down, gets your heart rate down, and just gets you back focused on what the task was in the first place. So, you know, I knew Mackenzie was going to come into this fight watching her training videos, very sharp with the striking and very confident and very aggressive. I thought, you know, with all the work she's doing with Jason Perillo, she probably wanted to come in and display that and, and, and kind of give herself that, that victory. Like, hey, all this striking work, I'm going to come in and knock somebody out. That's the feeling that I want. That's the, that's the reward. So... She tried, you know, she, she really put a lot of pressure on Jana Roba. Uh, I thought the clinch was kind of even. They were back and forth there. Uh, you know, Dern was able to hold her against the cage for a lot longer. You know, she was having a lot of troubles with her takedowns. You know, single leg, she would stall, not be able to sit her. She would lose position on the takedowns when she kind of decided to try to go for it. And, uh, you know... Ended up on her back a couple times where Jenna Robo was obviously high level enough in jiu-jitsu to not let her get much off. So, you know, that that kind of told her, listen, we got to keep this fight on the feet if we want to win and, and just kind of have a little bit more output, a little bit more volume. I thought the jab was beautiful. Uh, that was probably what won her that fight in the end, you know. And... Mackenzie's Mackenzie's improved a lot. Like when she first got in the UFC, I looked at her as like, ah, it's just one of those girls they're trying to build up, and you know she's got the look, she's got the accent, and the story behind her. And I'm like, I don't see that talent. Well, not the talent, but I don't see that full MMA style of fighting that is going to cause problems at the top. And I don't know if I see that yet, but I see a lot of improvement, and I see a lot of, you know correct moves and changes you know i know she switched teams and i think her and prillo is an awesome team right there i would keep sticking to that i would probably try to work on my transitions from strikes to takedowns uh but her striking's looking better and her jujitsu is always going to be a threat so solid win 
What can you say about Kevin Holland, man? The art of in-fight conversation. The guy is telling you to look for boogers in your nose. He's telling you he had dreams about this position. Uh, you know, he's telling you, oh, that was a nice shot. He's kind of giggling at you and having fun. The guy has more fun than anybody I've ever seen really in there. And it's, it's paying off. You know, like, I don't know if he's doing it on purpose. He says it's just how he is. But I thought that was just like high intelligence inside the fight right there with Jacare, who's such a nice guy, almost kind of lulled him into this conversation <laughs> when Kevin Holland's on his back. Everyone's saying in this fight, don't let Souza take you down. That could be the reason you lose. And, you know, there's Kevin Holland on his back having a good old time throwing jokes out and kind of lulling Souza into this, like, coffee talk conversation at a, at a dinner table, you know, at a coffee table, like, hey, man, like, you know, have a sip, it's dark roast, it's beautiful, uh, by the way, um, I'm gonna knock you out real quick, and then he just throws this crazy right hand from the bottom as he's, like, getting up, hits the chin perfectly, Souza is just like, what just happened, like, I thought I was just having a nice talk with a friend, and then, like, boom, this guy's done, and it was just, like, insane, one of those things you're probably never gonna see again, but Kevin Holland had probably the best year ever out of everybody, the guy's blowing up, I love watching him fight, he's growing on me, uh, and I, I don't, I'm not, like, a huge fan of cockiness and, like, the talking stuff, but, like, I love character and I like to, you know, I find him interesting and captivating. So I'm going to watch his fights always and I would never bet against him right now going up. And I think he's a legit guy that can can make waves, you know. He can challenge for a title in the near future. I think we need to see him fight maybe one or two more fights to get a good grasp on how good he really is but i think that knockout against jacare being on his back too and throwing up like triangles and submission threats on jacare like nothing that's a guy who is completely confident and calm in there like he has no fear that he can't beat you anywhere that's dangerous you know what i mean he's on his back having fun he's like i could i can get him here i'm gonna throw up some submissions i'm gonna throw a fucking crazy right hand like you can't teach that you know what i mean so i'm very impressed with kevin holland um other than that, some quick uh, talks, and then I'll get to, I, we might have a couple of Twitter questions I'll get to as well, but I wanted to give a shout out to uh, Cub Swanson, the guy's an OG of the game, he had that ACL surgery, he was out for like, what, two years, I mean, that could kill your mindset, at 38 years old, however old he is, like 36 or something, I don't know, but like, he's an older vet, you know, and, and, and he had to go through an ACL surgery and, and mentally battle through that, not just physically, but mentally, like get through that and still believe that you can compete at this level. He goes in and fights a young younger guy in, in Daniel Pineda who coming off a beautiful victory and he puts him away, finishes him later on, even after taking damage to that leg, you know, that he had surgery on and can even cause more issues with the mindset. But uh, he even said he was dealing with a lot of psychological things leading up to the fight. And I, I can understand that as a fighter, it happens. And you got to kind of convince yourself that, you know, those are just lies. And, and you got to kind of focus back and um, why you're there and what you believe in and, and this and that. But man, Cub, Cub looked great. Uh, really happy to see a guy like him win after such a long time out and dealing with that adversity. Uh, what can you say about Rafael Fiziev, man? That guy has some of the most vicious technical striking I've seen. I know he is Peter Jan's striking coach, which says a lot because that's a high-level striker in, his, in itself. But, man, Rafael Fiziev, this guy is going to be a nightmare. You try to get in there and exchange a kick with this guy, he's going to counter you. He's going to land some brutal switch kicks at a body. His hands are looking powerful as ever right now. Uh, he put Moicano out with like a three-piece and, and, and it was just like pop, 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 like just constant snap to his shots i thought you know mike moicano could have maybe survived a little bit longer i think the ref made a good decision though when you look at the after effects you know moicano kind of was stumbly and not really all there and i think he would have just took a lot more damage which it's always good to see afterwards you're like okay you know i can understand if you see a guy is still wobbly after the fact but it sucks when it does get called and you see a guy still kind of trying and still kind of looking like he wants to move but yeah, Moicano was definitely out. It was it, it was a legit stoppage. I, I thought it was, you know, warranted. So 
Uh, Gavin Tucker, another guy with amazing technique. I'm so impressed with watching how this guy fights. You know his, how calculated he is in there, and how composed he is with his pace, and how he wants to deliver strikes, and his clinch avoiding, and and returning knees into the clinch. And he's he honestly fights the perfect fight. Like he technically, he's just on point everywhere. Like. He clinches up with you. He trips you perfectly. He stays in side control. He uh, he 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 attains good position. He moves on from there. He looks for the submission. Back to the position. Back up on the feet. He's he's moving. He's got his head tucked down. He's got his hands up perfectly. Like just one of those guys that like has everything down pat. His style is really technical and like you know Billy Quarantillo was putting on a crazy pace and Gavin Tucker just stayed. Cool, calm, collected, kept his game plan going, was landing good shots, and was kind of slowing down the fight to his liking. And he, uh, you know, was able to just out touch Billy Quarantino the whole fight, you know. So great performance by him. And uh, shout out to Chase Hooper, too. He's somewhere eating some peanut MMs right now as we speak. Still probably got the big bag. He's probably sleeping with it. Uh, wouldn't be surprised if his bed was one of those car beds, you know, like maybe it's like Dana White's Ferrari or something he sleeps on. <laughs> he's just got the mattress in there. But uh yeah, he he's a young guy that that has a lot of room to build, but uh you know, he showed durability in that fight and to get a finish on Barrett who's a really is a grinder, really tough guy like that showed good signs for Hooper, you know, and he he kind of had his back against the wall, so that was good for him. Nice heel hook. Uh so yeah, that was 256. Let's see if we got some Twitter questions and then we'll get out of here. Um, Sniffles Torres versus Joanna next uh, from Alex Vot. Um, it could be, but I'm not. I think Joanna would would have a, a big advantage in that fight, but you never know. It could be what could be what they look for, but I I don't, I don't think that's the matchup. Uh, Joey Lynch. Will we get a Tiger Muay Thai versus Long Island? Uh. Funkmaster versus Peter Yan and Rafael Fizia versus Ally Quinta. You never know. I mean, not a bad idea. I think stylistically that'd be interesting because Ally Quinta has the wrestling. Would he be able to test uh, Fizia's takedown defense and jiu-jitsu? So that would be a cool fight to see. Um, Marty Bird on Twitter. What do you think of the future of the flyweight division now that there seems to be guys that could sell to an audience? Figueredo always looks for finishes. Marino tough as nails going shot for shot. Got Askarov, Pantoja, you know, a uh, bunch of other good guys. I mean, I think the division is great. You know, I think fans are appreciating it more and more. I think, I think the business, the UFC, is is appreciating it more and more. And I think that we have, you know, a good revamping of the division. I think there's going to be guys that kind of move. You know, I think some guys might go up to bantamweight eventually. Figueroa's a big guy. You never know with the weight cuts if they start to take a toll. Uh, and then, you know, then you got to wonder what happens there. You still got Joey Benavidez in the mix. Maybe some 35ers are, are smaller on the smaller end and they decide to move down. That's always a good business move for those guys because, man, you win two or three fights at flyweight and you're like you're you're challenging for a title so there's a fast track there if, you, if you're looking for that um but yeah the flyweights are i think one of the most exciting you know i think technical speed like i said earlier they have everything you know and it's like such a fast-paced fight you almost feel like you almost feel like you're worse of a fighter after you watch those guys move it's crazy but amazing fights um my fight's coming around the corner january 16th i think it's gonna be Fight Island Fight Island Dana White Put me on the charter Might be Fight Island Might have to make a little jam sesh uh send it in we'll call somebody out on the uke maybe we'll write a rap i don't know we gotta have something prepared but yeah january 16th tune in baby um give me a thumbs up please on the video appreciate the subscriptions we gotta get these up follow me instagram and twitter brian boom 135 and that's about it man love you